Good morning, First Unitarian. My name is Laura Fine. I am a therapist in the Denver area. And Reverend Mike asked me to talk a little bit about how a therapist thinks about trauma. I work with a lot of folks that have trauma and my best understanding of it is more or less that trauma is just unresolved pain. Um, as human beings, we're designed to experience intense emotion, but we're designed to experience it in community. And for various reasons, sort of, if we're beyond our capacity of tolerance for an intense emotion, it'll store in our system. If our system gets overwhelmed and I don't have the opportunity to talk about it, work through it, move through the stress response cycle, then the emotion can get stored in my system. I've been hearing a lot of people talk about this experience of going through this pandemic as a collective trauma. I don't think it has to be but it has a lot of the ingredients to be a collective trauma. It's a collective crisis for sure. Um, and a lot of the experience is just very confusing. And by definition, we're being asked to shelter in place. So we're experiencing a lot of it in isolation or in small community. And I'm talking to a lot of people that are just trying to hold it together. And the effect of that is that I'm sort of stuffing down this sort of intense part of my experience, right? And there's a lot of things about this experience that are intensely frightening. There's a lot of grief, there's a lot of loss, there's a lot of sadness, there's a lot of pain. Our body's designed to respond to stress by moving through a stress response cycle where our nervous system reacts and it wants to do something. Part of the challenges of what we're being asked to do is shelter in place and basically do nothing. So it makes sense that we want to do something to move through it. This is when I encourage people to acknowledge the stress that's happening in their system, to name it, and to let themselves move, because that's what your body wants to do. So let yourself clean your house if it makes you feel better. Let yourself jump up and down if it makes you feel better. Talk to a friend if it makes you feel better. Dance if it makes you feel better. Cry if it makes you feel better. That's how the stress response system moves through a process of emotion to a point of resolution. So we have the opportunity to go through this intense experience together and share it with one another, but it involves having to acknowledge all of the emotion and sort of move through it, even with the intensity. Another thing that I've been thinking a lot about for folks is that there's a lot about this current experience that's triggering and it's bringing up all sorts of unresolved traumas from people's histories. There's a lot of things about this context that's bringing up experiences of uncertainty, powerlessness, hopelessness, isolation, loneliness, anyone that's got unresolved experiences from their past like that, that's coming up right now. And there's certain ways where I think about this at its best as an opportunity um, to notice what's coming up and share it with people, this time with support, with connection, and in a collective way where I get to notice it, I get to talk about it, I get to share it with someone, I get to move through it, and potentially I get to heal from it because I'm doing it together with other folks. Good morning. I'm really excited this morning to talk about trauma-informed organizations. These are organizations that create safe, physical and emotional spaces so that people can feel welcome, they recognize potential lifelong and generational impacts of trauma. A trauma-informed organization acts to avoid triggering past trauma and also puts measures into place that will avoid creating additional trauma. An organization becomes trauma-informed by creating a safe and welcoming environment at every level of the organization. Um, safety is fostered trustworthiness and transparent communication is engendered. In other words, in a trauma-informed organization, what you see is what you get. Um, they it, support peer collaboration and peer support, as well as collaboration up and down the organization. They incorporate empowerment, voice, and choice at every level. And finally, a trauma-informed organization does not sidestep dif difficult conversations. A trauma-informed organization actively addresses cultural, historical, and gender issues involving trauma. 
Safe environments are created in these organizations by instituting those practices at every level of the organization. And that includes um, governance and leadership uh, policy that guides the development of safe environments, um, a physical environment that includes natural lighting, escape routes, enough um, personal space to feel comfortable. It's important to have engagement and involvement because when people are engaged in the process of developing and maintaining a trauma-informed organization, more issues are addressed and a wider range are addressed because we are involved in the process of honoring all of our experiences. Collaboration is also important in the development of trust. Training and learning is a really important part of trauma-informed organizations because it allows us to become empowered and to have skills to effectively use our voices and make good choices that matter to us all. And last but not least, financing is a very important piece in uh, a trauma-informed organization, specifically um, the transparency in financing and people having a voice in financing. This is because in the past, people have been People who have been marginalized have been kept out of money and out of financial decisions and have lost um, a lot as a result of that. And so financing is important. As I identify just a few examples of some trauma-informed practices in place at FUSD, if you have anything to add that you see at FUSD that's trauma-informed, please feel free to enter it on the chat. In terms of government leadership and policy, um, many people have spoken from the pulpit about historical trauma, including immigration and racial issues. So our leadership is behind some pieces of trauma-informed policy. Um, our physical environment is lovely. It has multiple exits and we're kept informed about what to do in case of an emergency. We have collaboration, including recently, we had the opportunity to move through a process of collaboration in the development of our congregational covenant. We're all invited to be actively engaged in any number of places here in choir and class and service and coffee hour and training. There uh, is usually some kind of class or training going on here, which um, empowers us all. And uh, the finances that we have here are transparent and we are uh, reviewing them each year at our congregational meeting. And one last piece about congregational uh, life here um, and how it corresponds to trauma-informed practices. An important part to maintaining trauma-informed organization is to continually monitor and evaluate our progress. And I think we do a great job here. Thanks so much for being here. I miss you guys. Good morning, First Unitarian. Once again, I need to let you know uh, about it just briefly before I uh, add my own reflection on this trauma. I need to let you know uh, there were a couple things we learned about uh, just recently uh, regarding members of our congregation. Judith Bortz is uh, recuperating from a spinal surgery. Uh, please keep Judith in your thoughts and prayers. Send her a card. Give her a call if you can. Uh, and Deanna Kasky. Uh, has uh, her father is in home hospice and Deanna is spending a lot of time with him right now uh, and her mother is also in a care facility uh, and she is unable to visit her so just want to wish all the uh, support and love to Deanna that we possibly can because uh, that sounds like a seriously stressful uh, place to be in. So uh, I just have so much gratitude for Laura Fine and Melanie Deem for saying yes when I asked them to share some of their reflections, some of their expertise uh, about trauma. Um, we are so blessed to have people like that in our community. So I got asked this week, when I told someone what the service was about, oh gosh, why are we gonna talk about trauma? Like there's enough trauma in the world already, can't we focus on something more positive? Um, and you might be feeling something similar, 
So I want to respond to that briefly. Uh, there is, of course, enough trauma in the world. There's always enough trauma in the world. And I think we as a community, we want to respond to that. We know about the statistics of sexual harassment and uh, assault uh, when it comes to women. We know uh, we have veterans of war among us. We know that the economy is ruthless and brutal and crushing to people who do not have resources. We know, um, we know about the violence of poverty and uh, racism and immigration laws and on and on. And, and this congregation has said repeatedly, emphatically, that we want to be welcoming and we want to be accepting, we want to be healing, and we want to be loving to everyone who comes to us. That's why we're talking about trauma. To take the stigma off of talking about trauma, at least as much as we can, to be better able to acknowledge trauma within ourselves and, with, with, and in others so that we will be able to appropriately and lovingly respond. Or even, as Melanie said so well, so that we as a community, as an institution, do not unwittingly perpetuate trauma. And that's essentially why we're talking about this. I want to hold up one more aspect of trauma, though, especially why we're talking about it in church, and that is the miraculous, unspeakable brilliance of human resilience. I find myself continually just floored and moved and um, inspired when I talk to people about some of the things that they have been through. Spousal abuse and police abuse and the death of children and homelessness and single parenthood and sexual assault, to name just a very, very few. And the vast majority of these folks, at least the ones I talk to here in church, are astonishingly healthy and strong and resourceful and loving and sane people. I think about some of the people who've spoken from our pulpit right here in this room that I'm in. I think about people like Hassan Latif and Reverend Tawana Davis and Theo Wilson and many others who have been through hell and who have shown us what love and courage and healing can look like um, when it's surrounded by community and there's a chance to, to process it uh, and move through it, uh, as Laura was talking about. So we're talking about trauma because trauma is real and trauma can be deadly. And trauma can be deadening to the spirit when those emotions get stuck in our bodies. But that is not what calls to us. It is, it is life that calls to us. Life in its fullest, most beautiful, most holy, vibrant sense that we seek to move into. And we seek this despite everything, right? Despite trauma, despite everything. Last week on Easter Sunday, I closed that sermon with a quote from uh, the great Howard Thurman. And I can't do better uh, than to close with that same quote again because it leads us where, uh, where I think this service needs to go. Howard Thurman uh, wrote, don't ask what the world needs. Ask what makes you come alive. Then go and do it. Because what the world needs is people who have come alive. So for the next few minutes, uh, as the music plays, you are invited to type into the chat box to share with your community what makes you come alive. Thank you for joining us today.
Thank you.